Countdown to Halloween 2022, featuring eerie and uncanny tales of haunts, ghosts, and suspense. The first Monday of every month, at exactly midnight, a new story will appear on StoryLink Radio's YouTube channel as we count down to Halloween 2022. Plan to catch these each month or you'll miss one. Each story will be 13 to 30 minutes long. And now, tonight's story from StoryLink Radio. The Mask by Richard Marsh The author of tonight's story had his biggest success with a supernatural thriller titled The Beetle in 1897. That novel initially outsold Bram Stoker's Dracula, which had also come out that year. Equally sensational is tonight's story from 1892, The Mask, which features a deranged vampirist with a genius for disguise who is undoubtedly one of the most fascinating femme fatales in the whole of horror fiction. Chapter 1. What Happened in the Train Wigmakers have brought their art to such perfection that it is difficult to detect false hair from real. (laughs) Why should not the same skill be shown in the manufacture of a mask? Our faces, in one sense, are nothing but masks. Why should not the imitation be as good as the reality? (laughs) Why, for instance, should not this face of mine, as you see it, be nothing but a mask, a a something which I can take off and on? She laid her two hands softly against her cheeks. There was a ring of laughter in her voice. Mm, Yes, and such a mask would not only be, in the highest sense, a, a work of art, but it would would also be a thing of beauty, a joy forever. You think that I am beautiful? Well, I could not doubt with her velvet skin just tinted with the bloom of her health, her little dimpled chin, her ripe red lips, her, her flashing teeth, her great inscrutable dark eyes, her wealth of hair which gleamed in the sunlight, and I told her so. So you think that I am beautiful? How odd. How very odd. I could not tell if she was in jest or earnest. Her her lips were parted by a smile, but it did not seem to me that it was laughter which was in her eyes. And you have only seen me for the first time a few hours ago? Yes, uh, such has been my ill fortune. She rose. She stood for a moment looking down at me. And you think there is nothing in my theory about a mask? On the contrary, I I think there's a great deal in any theory you may advance. A waiter brought me a card on a salver. Gentleman wishes to see you, sir. I glanced at the card. On it was printed, George Davis, Scotland Yard. As I was looking at the piece of pasteboard she passed behind me, Perhaps I shall see you again when we will continue our discussion about a mask. (laughs) I rose and bowed. She went from the veranda down the steps into the garden. I turned to the waiter. Who is that lady? Uh, I don't know her name, sir. She came in last night. She has a private sitting room at number 22. Here he hesitated. Then he added, Um, I'm not sure, sir, but I think the lady's name is James, uh, Mrs. James. Ah, well, where is this Mr. Davis? Show him into my room. I went to my room and waited him. Mr. Davis proved to be a short, spare man, with iron-gray whiskers and a quite unassuming manner. You had my telegram, Mr. Davis? We had, sir. I believe you are not unacquainted with my name. Know it very well, sir. The circumstances of my case are so peculiar, Mr. Davis, that instead of going to the local police, I I thought it better to at once place myself in communication with headquarters. Mr. Davis bowed. I came down yesterday afternoon by the express from Paddington. I was alone in a first-class carriage. At Swindon, a young gentleman got in. 
He seemed to me to be about twenty-three or four years of age, unmistakably a gentleman. We had some conversation together. At Bath, he offered me a drink out of his flask. It was getting evening then. I have been hard at it for the last few weeks. I was tired. I suppose I fell asleep. And in my sleep, I dreamed. You dreamed? As I dreamed, I was being robbed. <laughs> the detective smiled. Yes. At your surmise, I woke up to find my dream was real. But the curious part of the matter is that I was unable to tell you where my dream ended and where my wakefulness began. I, I dreamed that something... Something was leaning over me, rifling my person, some hideous, gasping thing, which in its eagerness kept emitting short cries which were of the nature of barks. <laughs> Although I say I dreamed this, I, I am not at all sure I did not actually see it taking place. The, the purse was drawn from my trousers pocket. Something was taken out of it. I distinctly heard the chink of money, and then the purse was returned to where it was before. My watch and chain were taken, the studs out of my shirt, the, links out of my wristbands. My pocket book was treated as my purse had been. Something was taken out of it, and then the book returned. My keys were taken. My dressing bag was taken from the rack, opened, and articles were taken out of it, though I could not see what articles they were. The bag was replaced on the rack, the keys in my pocket. Well, well, didn't you see the face of the person who did all this? Uh, that, <laughs> yes, that was a curious part of it. I tried to, but I failed. It seemed to me that the face was hidden by a, a veil. Yeah, yeah. The thing was simple enough. You shall have to look for your young gentleman friend, eh? Wait until I have finished. The thing, and now I say thing because in my dream I was strongly, nay horribly, under the impression that I was at the mercy of some sort of animal, some, some creature or, of the ape or monkey tribe. There, nah, certainly, you dreamed. You think so? Still, wait a moment more. The thing, whatever it was, when it had robbed me, opened my shirt at the breast, and deliberately tearing my skin with what seemed to be talons, put its mouth to the wound, and gathering my flesh between its teeth, it bit me to the bone. Here is sufficient evidence to prove that then, at least... I did not dream. Unbuttoning my shirt, I showed Mr. Davis the cicatrix. The pain was so intense that it awoke me. I sprang to my feet. I saw the thing. You saw it? I saw it. It was crouching at the other end of the carriage. The door was open. I saw it for an instant as it leapt out into the night. Uh, it, but what rate do you suppose the train was traveling just then? Uh, the carriage blinds were drawn. The train had just left New Abbott. The creature must have been biting me when the train was actually drawn up at the platform. It leaped out of the carriage as the train was restarting. And did you see its face? I did. It was the face of a devil. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Fountain, but um, you're not trying on me the plot of your next novel just to see, to see how it goes, are you? Uh, I wish I were, my lad, but I am not. It was the face of a devil so hideous, a face that the only detail I was able to grasp was that it had a pair of eyes which gleamed at me like burning coals. Uh, where was the young gentleman then? He had disappeared. Precisely. And I suppose you did not only dream you had been robbed? I had been robbed of everything which was of the slightest value except eighteen shillings. Exactly that sum had been left in my purse. Hmm. Well, now perhaps you will give me a description of the young gentleman and his flask. I swear it was not he who robbed me. Yes, well, there were. The possibility is that he was disguised. To my eye, it seems unreasonable to suppose that he should have removed his disguise while engaged in the very act of robbing you. Anyhow, you give me his description, and I shouldn't be surprised if I was able to lay my finger on him on the spot. So I described him, the well-knit young man, with his merry eyes, his slight mustache, his graceful manners. If he was the thief, then I am no judge of character. There was something about him which, to my eyes, marked him as an emphatically a gentleman. The detective only smiled. 
Yes, well, the first thing I shall have to do will be to telegraph all over the country a list of the stolen properties, and then I may possibly treat myself to a little private think. Your story is a rather curious one, Mr. Fountain. And then later in the day I may want to say a word or two with you again. Um, I shall find you here. I said that he would. When he had gone, I sat down and wrote a letter. When I had finished the letter, I went along the corridor towards the front door of the hotel. As I was going, I saw in front of me a figure, the figure of a man. He was standing still, and his back was turned my way. But something about him struck me with such a sudden force of recognition that, stopping short, I stared. <laughs> I suppose I must have unconsciously have uttered some sort of exclamation, because the instant I stopped short, with a quick movement, he wheeled right round, we faced each other. You! I exclaimed. I hurried forward with a cry of recognition. He advanced, as I thought, to greet me. But he had only taken a step or two in my direction when he turned into the room upon his right and shutting the door behind him disappeared. The man in the train, I told myself. If I had had any doubt upon the subject, his sudden disappearance would have cleared my doubt right away. If he was anxious to avoid a meeting with me, well, all the more reason why I should seek an interview with him. I went to the door of the room which he had entered, and without the slightest hesitation I turned the handle. The room was empty. There could be no doubt of that. It was an ordinary hotel sitting room, own brother to the one which I occupied myself, and as I saw at a glance contained no article of furniture behind which a person could be concealed. But at the other side of the room was another door. Aha! My gentleman, I said to myself, has gone through that. Crossing the room again, I turned the handle. This time, without result, the door was locked. I rapped against the panels. Instantly, someone addressed me from within. Who's that? Who's there? The voice, to my surprise, and also somewhat to my discomfiture, was a woman's. Uh, excuse me, but might I say one word to the gentleman who has just entered the room? What's that? Who are you? Uh, I'm the gentleman who came down with him in the train. What? What? The door opened. A woman appeared, the lady whom the waiter had said he believed was a Mrs. Jane's, and who had advanced that curious story about a mask being made to imitate the human face. <laughs> she had a dressing jacket on and her glorious hair was flowing loose over her shoulders. I was so surprised to see her that for a moment I was tongue-tied. The surprise seemed to be mutual, for the pretty air of bewilderment stepping back into the room, she partially closed the door. Oh, I, I thought it was the waiter. May I ask, sir, what it is you want? I beg ten thousand pardons, but might I just have one word with your husband? Uh, with whom, sir? Your husband. My husband. Again, throwing the door wide open, she stood and stared at me. I refer, madam, to the gentleman whom I just saw enter the room. <laughs> I don't know if you intend an impertinence, sir, or merely a jest. Her lip curled. Her eyes flashed. It was plain she was offended. I just saw, madam, in the corridor, a gentleman with whom I travelled yesterday from London. I advanced to meet him. As I did so, he turned into your sitting-room. When I followed him, I found it empty, so I took it for granted he had come in here. Well, you are mistaken, sir. I know no gentleman in the hotel. As for my husband, my husband has been dead three years. Now, I could not contradict her. Yet it was certain I had seen the stranger turn into the outer room, and I told her so. If any man entered my sitting-room, which was an unwarrantable liberty to take, he must be in it now. Except for yourself, no one has come near my bedroom. I have had the door locked, and as you see, I have been dressing. Are you sure you have not been dreaming? If I had been dreaming, I had been dreaming with my eyes open. And yet, if I had seen the man enter the room, and I could have sworn I had, where was he now? She offered with scathing irony to let me examine her own apartment. Indeed, she opened the door so wide that I could see all over it from where I stood. <laughs> yes, and it was plain enough that, with the exception of herself, it had no other occupant. Yet, 
And yet I asked myself as I retreated with my tail huddled between my legs, how could I possibly have been mistaken? The only hypothesis I could hit upon was that my thoughts had been so deeply engaged upon the matter that they had made me the victim of a hallucination. Perhaps my nervous system had temporarily been disorganized by my misadventures of the day before. And yet, and yet this was the final conclusion to which I came upon the matter if I had not seen my fellow passenger standing in front of me, a creature of flesh and blood. I would never trust the evidence of my eyes again. The most ardent ghost seer never saw a ghost in the middle of the day. I went for a walk towards Avacom. My nerves might be a little out of order, though not to the extent of seeing things which were non-existent, and it was quite possible that the fresh air and exercise might do them good. I lunched at Avacom, spending the afternoon. As the weather was so fine upon the seashore, in company with my thoughts, my pipe, and a book. But as the day wore on, a sea mist stole over the land, and as I returned Torquay wards, it was already growing dusk. I went back by the way of the seafront, as I was passing Hesketh Crescent, and I stood for a moment, looking out into the gloom which was gathering over the sea. As I looked, I heard, or thought that I heard, a sound just behind me. As I heard it, the blood seemed to run cold in my veins, and I had to clutch at the coping of the sea wall to prevent my knees from giving way under me. It was the sound which I had heard in my dream in the train, and which had seemed to come from the creature which was robbing me, the cry or bark of some wild beast. It came once, one short, quick, gasping bark. Then all was still. I looked round, fearing to see I know not what. Nothing was in sight. Yet although nothing could be seen, I felt that there was something there. But as the silence continued, I began to laugh at myself beneath my breath. I had not supposed that I was such a coward as to be frightened at less than a shadow. Moving away from the walk, I was about to resume my walk, when it came again, a choking, breathless bark so close to me that I seemed to feel the warm breath upon my cheek. Looking swiftly round, I saw, almost touching mine, the face of the creature, which I had seen but only for an instant in the train. Part Two, Mary Brooker Are, are you ill? I am a little tired, yes. You look as though you had seen a ghost. I am sure you are not well. I did not feel well. I felt as though I had seen a ghost, and something worse than a ghost. I had found my way back to the hotel, how I scarcely knew. The first person I met was Mrs. James. She was in the garden, which ran all round the building. My appearance seemed to occasion her anxiety. Yes, I am quite sure you are not well. Do sit down. Let me get you something to drink. Uh, miss, thanks. I'll, I'll go to my own room. I, I have not been very well lately. A little upsets me. She seemed reluctant to let me go. Her solicitude was flattering, though. If there had been a little less of it, I should have been equally content. She even offered me her arm. That I laughingly declined. I was not quite in such a piteous plight as to be in need of that. At last I escaped her. As I entered my sitting-room, someone rose to greet me. It was Mr. Davis. Hey, Mr. Fountain, are you not well? Uh, my appearance seemed to strike him as I struck the lady. I have had a shock, I said. Will you bring the bell and order me some brandy? A shock? Hmm. He looked at me curiously. What sort of shock would that be? I will tell you when you have ordered the brandy. I really am in need of something to revive me. I fancy my nervous system must be altogether out of order. He rang the bell. I sank into an easy chair, really grateful for the support which it afforded me. Although he sat still, I was conscious that his eyes were on me all the time. When the waiter had brought the brandy, Mr. Davis gave rein to his curiosity. Well, I, I hope that nothing serious has happened. It depends on what you call serious. 
A pause allowed the spirit to take effect. It did me some good. You, um, remember what I told you about the strange sound which was uttered by the creature which robbed me in the train? Uh, I have, uh, I have heard that sound again. Indeed, he observed me attentively. I thought he would be skeptical. He was not. Can you describe the sound? Well, it is difficult to describe, though. <laughs> when it is once heard, it is impossible not to recognize it when it is heard again. I shuddered at the thought of it. It is like the cry of some wild beast when in a state of frenzy, just a just a short, jerky, half-strangled yelp, really. Uh, so may I ask her what circumstances under which you heard it? I was looking at the seafront in, uh, in, in front of Hesketh Crescent. I, I heard it close behind me, not once, but twice. And then the second time I saw the face which I saw on the train. I took another drink of brandy. I fancy that Mr. Davis saw even how even the mere recollection affected me. Hmm. Do you think your assailant could by any possibility have been a woman? A woman? Was the face you saw anything like that? He produced from his pocket a pocketbook, and from the pocketbook a photograph. He handed it to me. I regarded it intently. It was not a good photograph, but it was a strange one. The more I looked at it, the more it grew upon me that there was a likeness, a dim and fugitive likeness, but still a likeness, to the face which had glared at me only half an hour before. But surely this is not a woman, I declared. Tell me, first of all, if you trace in it any resemblance at all. I, I do, and I don't. In the portrait, the face, as I know it, is grossly flattered, and yet in the portrait it is sufficiently hideous. Mr. Davis stood up. He seemed a little excited. I believe I have hit it. You have hit it? The portrait which you hold in your hand is the portrait of a criminal lunatic who escaped last week from Broadmoor. A criminal lunatic? As I looked at the portrait, I perceived that it was the face of a lunatic. The woman, for it is a woman, it is a perfect, is a perfect devil as artful as she is wicked, you see. She was there doing Her Majesty's pleasure for murder, which was attended with the details of horrible cruelty. She was more than suspected of having had a hand in other crimes. Since the portrait was taken, she has deliberately burnt her face with a red-hot poker, disfiguring herself almost beyond recognition. But there is another circumstance which I should mention, Mr. Davis. Do you know that this morning I saw the young gentleman, too? The detective stared. What young gentleman is that? The young fellow who got into the train at Swindon and who offered me his flask. You saw him? Where? Here, in the hotel. The devil you did! And you spoke to him? Well, I tried to. And he hooked it. <laughs> well, that's the odd part of the thing. You say there is something odd about <laughs> everything I tell you, and I must confess there is. When you left me this morning, Mr. Davis, I, I wrote a letter. And when I had written it, I left the room, and as I was going along the corridor, I saw in front of me the young man who was with me in the train. You are sure it was he? <laughs> Quite certain. When first I saw him, he had his back to me. I, I suppose he heard me coming. Anyhow, he turned, and we are face to face. The recognition, I believe, was mutual, because as I advanced, he cut his lucky. <laughs> He turned into a room upon his right. And of course, you followed him. I did. I made no bones about it. I was not three seconds after him. But when I entered, <clears throat> the room was empty. Empty, you say? Well, yes, it was an ordinary sitting room like this, but on the other side of it there was a door. I tried that door. It was locked. I wrapped it with my knuckles, and a woman answered. A woman? A woman. She not only answered, she came out. Was she anything like that portrait? <laughs> I laughed. The idea of instituting any comparison between the horror and the portrait and that vision of health and loveliness was too ludicrous. She was a lady who was stopping in the hotel with whom I already had had some conversation, who is about as unlike that portrait as anything could possibly be. Uh, a Mrs. James. James. A Mrs. James. Hmm. 
The detective bit his fingernails. He seemed to be turning over something in his mind. And did you see the man? Well, that is where the oddness of the thing comes in. She declared that there was no man. What do you mean? She declared that no one had been near her bedroom while she had been in it. <clears throat> that there was no one in it at that particular moment is beyond a doubt, because she opened the door to let me see. I am inclined to think upon reflection that, after all, the man may have been concealed in the outer room, that I overlooked him in my haste, and that he made good his escape while I was knocking the lady's tour. But... But, but if, he, if he had a finger in the pie, that knocks the other theory upon the head. He nodded towards a portrait which I was still holding in my hand. A man like that would scarcely have such a pal as Mary Brooker. Well, I confess, Mr. Davis, that the whole affair is a mystery to me. I suppose that your theory is that the flask out of which I drank was drugged? Well, I should say upon the face of it that there can't be two doubts about that. The detective stood reflecting. I should like to have a look at this, Mrs. James. I will have a look at her. I'll go down to the office here. I think it's just possible I may be treated to a peep at her room. When he had gone, I was haunted by the thought of that criminal lunatic, who was at least so far sane that she had been able to make good her escape from Broadmoor. It was only when Mr. Davis had left me that I discovered that he had left the portrait behind him. I looked at it. Ugh. What a face it was. Think, I said to myself, of being left at the mercy of such a woman as that. The words had scarcely left my lips when, without any warning, the door of my room opened, and just as I was taking it for granted there was Mr. Davis come back for the portrait, in walked the young man with whom I had travelled in the train. He was dressed exactly as he had been yesterday, and he wore the same indefinable but unmistakable something which denotes good breeding. Uh, excuse me, he observed as he stood with the handle of the door in one hand and his hat in the other. But I believe you are the gentleman with whom I travelled yesterday from Swindon. In my surprise, I was for a moment tongue-tied. Um, I do not think I have made a mistake. N no, I said, or rather stammered. Y y you have not made a mistake. Yeah, yes. It is only by a fortunate accident that I had just learned that you are staying in the hotel. Pardon my intrusion, sir, but when I changed carriages at Exeter, I left behind me a cigar case. A cigar case? Did you notice it? I thought it might have caught your eye. It was a present to me, and one I greatly valued. It, it matched this flask. I was not aware that you changed carriages at Exeter. Yes. I wondered if you noticed it. I, I fancy you were asleep. Well, if... A singular thing happened to me before I reached my journey's end, a singular and disagreeable thing. Oh, well, how do you mean, sir? I was robbed. Robbed? Did you notice anybody getting into the carriage when you, as you say, got out? Well, um, not that I'm aware of now. You know, it was pretty dark. Why, goodness gracious, is it possible that after all it wasn't my imagination? What wasn't your imagination? He came closer to me, so close that he touched my sleeve with his gloved hand. Do you know why I left the carriage when I did? I left it because I was bothered by the thought that there was someone in it besides us two. Someone in it besides us two? Uh, <laughs> some, someone underneath the seat. I was dozing off as you were doing. More than once I woke up under the impression that someone was twitching my legs beneath the seat, pinching them, even pricking them. Did you not look to see if Edwin was there? He would laugh at me, but I suppose it was I was silly. Something restrained me. I preferred to make a bolt of it and become the victim of my own imagination. <laughs> well, then you left me to become the victim of something besides your imagination, if what you say is correct. All at once the stranger made a dart at the table. I suppose he had seen the portrait lying there, because without any sort of ceremony he picked it up and stared at it. As I observed him commenting inwardly about the fellow's coolness, I distinctly saw a shudder pass all over him. Possibly it was a shudder of aversion, because when he had stared his fill, he turned to me and asked, And who, may I ask, is this hideous-looking creature? Well, that is a criminal lunatic who has escaped from Broadmoor 
one Mary Brooker. Mary Brooker. Mary Brooker. Her. Oh, Mary Brooker's face will haunt me for many a day. He laid down the portrait down hesitatingly, as if it had for him some dreadful fascination which had made him reluctant to let it go. Wholly at a loss what to say or do, whether to detain the man or to permit him to depart, I, I turned away and moved across the room. The instant I did, I heard behind me the sharp, frenzied yelp which I had heard in the train, which I had heard again when I had been looking at the sea in front of Hesketh Crescent. I turned on a pivot. The young man was staring at me. Did you hear that? he said. Hear it? Of course I heard it. Good God! He was shuddering so that it seemed to me that he could scarcely stand. Do you know that it was that sound, coming from underneath the seat in the carriage, which made, made, made me make a bolt of it? I'm afraid you must excuse me. Uh, there, there, There's my card. I'm staying at the Royal. I'll perhaps look for you again tomorrow. Before I'd recovered my sense of presence of mind to sufficiently interfere, he had moved to the door and was out of the room. As he went out, Mr. Davis entered. They, they must have brushed each other as they passed. Uh, I forgot the portrait of that Brooker woman, Mr. Davis began. Why didn't you stop him? I exclaimed. Well, stop whom, sir? Didn't you see the man who just went out? Well, oh, well, why should I stop him? Isn't he a friend of yours? He's the man who travelled in the carriage with me from Swindon. Davis was out of the room like a flash of lightning. When he returned, he returned alone. Where is he? I demanded. That's what I would like to know. Mr. Davis wiped his brow. He must have travelled at the rate of about sixty miles an hour. He's nowhere to be seen. Whatever made you let him go? He left his card. I took it up. It was inscribed, George Etheridge, Coliseum Club. He says he's staying at the Royal Hotel. I don't believe he had anything to do with the robbery. He came to me in the most natural manner possible and inquired for a cigar case which he left behind him in the carriage. He says that while I was sleeping, he changed carriages at Exeter because he suspected that someone was underneath the seat. <laughs> did he indeed? He says they did not look to see if anybody was actually there because, well, Something restrained him. Yes. I'd like to have a little conversation with that young gentleman. Well, I believe he speaks the truth for this reason. While he was talking, there came the sound which I have described to you before. That sort of bark yelp there. Yes, that sort of bark yelp. There was nothing to show from whence it came. I declare to you that it seemed to me that it came from out of space. I never saw a man so frightened as he was. As he stood trembling just where you are standing now, he stammered out that it was because he had heard that sound from underneath the seat in the carriage that he decided that discretion was the better part of valor, and instead of gratifying his curiosity, had chosen to retreat. Table d'hôte had commenced when I sat down. My right-hand neighbor was Mrs. James. She asked me if I still suffered any ill effects from my fatigue. I suppose, she said. Well, I assured her that all ill effects had passed away. Yes, yes, I suppose that you have not thought anything of what I said to you this morning about my theory of the mask. I confess that I had not. Well, you should. It is a subject which is a crochet of mine, and to which I have devoted many years and many, many curious years of my life. I... Own that personally, I do not see exactly where that interest comes in. No, no. Do me a favor. Come to my sitting room after dinner, won't you? And I will show you where the interest uh, comes in. Well, um, how do you mean? <laughs> Come and see. She amused me. I went and saw. Dinner being finished, the proceedings and when together we entered her apartment, that apartment which the morning I thought I had seen entered by my fellow passenger, uh, took me a little by surprise. Now, I am going to make you my confidant, you, an entire stranger, you, whom I never saw in my life before this morning. I'm mm? a judge of character, and in you I feel that I may place uh, implicit confidence. I'm going to show you all my secrets. I am going to induct you into the hidden mysteries. I am going to lay bare before you 
the mind of an inventor. But it doesn't follow because I have confidence in you that I have confidence in all the world besides. So, <laughs> before we begin, if you please, uh, I will lock the door. As you're suiting the action to the word, I venture to remonstrate. But, my dear madam, don't you think? <laughs> I think nothing. I know that I don't wish to be taken unawares and to have published what I have devoted the better portion of my life to keeping secret. But if the, these matters are of such confidential nature, I assure you, my good sir, my good sir, I locked the door. And she did. I was sorry that I had so hastily accepted her invitation, but I, I yielded. The door was locked. Going to the fireplace, she leaned her arm upon a mantel shelf. Did it ever occur to you, she asked, what possibilities might be open to us if, for instance, um, Smith could temporarily become Jones? Um, I don't quite follow you, I said, and I did not. Uh, suppose that you could at will become another person and in the character of that other person could move about unrecognized among your friends, what lessons might you learn? Well, <clears throat> I suspect um, that they would, for the most part, be lessons of a decidedly unpleasant kind. Yes. We'll carry the idea a step further. Think of the possibilities of a dual existence. Think of living two distinct and separate lives, Think of doing as Robinson what you condemn as Brown. Think of doubling the parts and hiding within your own breast the secret of the devil. Think of leading a triple life. Think of leading many lives in one, of being the old man and the young, the husband and the wife, the father and the son. Think, <laughs> think in other words, of the unattainable. Not unattainable. <laughs> Moving away from the mantel shelf, she raised her hand above her head with a gesture which was all at once dramatic. I have attained. You have attained. Attained to what? To the multiple existence. It is the secret of the mask. I told myself some years ago that it ought to be possible to make a mask which should in every respect so closely resemble the human countenance, it would be difficult, if not impossible, even under the most trying conditions, to tell the false face from the real. I made experiments, and I succeeded. I learned the secret of the mask. Look at that. Here she took a leather case from her pocket. Abstracting its contents, she handed them to me. I was holding in my hand what seemed to me to be a, a preparation of some sort of skin, gold beater's skin, it might have been. And, and on one side, it was curiously and even delicately painted. Uh, on the other side, they were fastened to the skin, some oddly shaped bosses or pads. And the whole affair, I suppose, I did not weigh half an ounce. And while I was examining it, Mrs. James looked down at me. You hold in your hand, she said, the secret of the mask. Here, give it to me. I gave it to her. With it in her hand, she disappeared into the room beyond. Hardly had she vanished than the bedroom door reopened, and an old lady came out. <clears throat> My daughter begs you that you will excuse her. <clears throat> She was a quaint old lady, about sixty years of age, with silver hair and corkscrew ringlets of a bygone day. My, my daughter is not uh, very ceremonious, I'm afraid, and is so wrapped up in what she calls her experiments that I sometimes tell her she is wanting in consideration. <laughs> While she is making her preparations, perhaps you allow me to offer you a cup of tea. Mm? The old lady carried a canister in her hand, which apparently contained tea. A tea service was standing on a little side table. The kettle was singing on the hob, in fact. The old lady began to measure out the tea into the teapot. <laughs> we always carry our tea with us, hmm? 
Neither my daughter nor I care for tea which they give you in the hotels, eh? A meekly acquiesced. To tell the truth, I was a trifle bewildered. I had had no idea that Mrs. James was accompanied by her mother. <laughs> had not the old lady come out of the room immediately after the young one had gone into it, I should have suspected a trick that I was being made subject to experiment with the mysterious mask. As it was, I was more than half inclined to ask her if she was really what she seemed to be. Uh, but I decided, as it turned out, most unfortunately, to keep my own counsel and to watch the sequence of events. Pour me out a cup of tea, the old lady seated herself in a low chair in front of the fire. Is my, my daughter. Uh, uh, she thinks a great deal of her experiments. I hope you will not encourage her. Frankly, she quite frightens me at times. She says such dreadful things. I sipped my tea and smiled. Well, I don't think there's much cause for fear. Oh, no, no cause for fear. When she tells one that she might commit a murder, that a hundred thousand people might see her do it, and not that but not by any possibility could the crime be brought home to her. Perhaps she exaggerates a little. <laughs> do you think that she can hear? Ah. The old lady glanced round in the direction of the bedroom. Well, you should know better than I. Perhaps it would be as well to say nothing which you would not like her to hear. Well, I must tell someone. Uh, I must. It, it frightens me. She, she says it is a dream she had. Well, <laughs> I don't think if I were you, I would pay much attention to a dream. The old lady rose from her seat. I did not altogether like her manner. She came and stood in front of me rubbing her hands nervously, one over the other. She certainly seemed considerably disturbed. She, she, she came down yesterday from London, and she says that she, she she dreamed that she tried one of her experiments in the train. In the train? Yes, and in order that her experiment might be thorough, she robbed the man. She robbed the man? Yes, and in her pocket I found this. The old lady held out my watch and chain. Oh, it was unmistakable. The watch was a hunter. I could see the my crest and monogram were engraved upon the case. I stood up. The strangest part of the affair was that when I gained my feet, it seemed as though something had happened to my legs. I could not move them. Probably something in my demeanor struck the old lady as strange. She smiled at me. What is the matter with you? Huh? Why do you look so funny? That is my watch and chain. You're watching, Jane. Yours? Ah. And why don't you take them, hmm? She held them out to me in her extended palm. She was not six feet from where I stood, yet I could not reach for them. My feet seemed glued to the floor. I, I cannot move. So, so, something's happened to my legs. Ah. <laughs> Perhaps it's the tea, hmm? I will go and tell my daughter. Before I could say a word to stop her, she was gone. I was fastened like a post to the ground. What had happened to me was more than I could say. It had all come in an instant. I felt as I had felt in the railway carriage the day before, as, as though I were in a dream. I looked around me. I, I saw the teacup on the little table at my side. I, I saw the flickering fire. I, I saw the shaded lamps. I was conscious of the presence of all these things, but I... I saw them as if I saw them in a dream. A sense of nausea was stealing over me, a sense of horror. I was afraid of I knew not what. I was unable to ward off or to control my fear. I cannot say how long I stood there, for certainly some minutes, helpless, struggling against the pressure which seemed to weigh upon my brain. Suddenly, without any sort of warning, the bedroom door opened, and there walked into the room the young man who before dinner had visited me in my own apartment, and who yesterday had traveled with me in the train. He came straight across the room. With the most perfect coolness, he stood right in front of me. I could see that in his shirt front were my studs. When he raised his hands, I could see that in his wristbands were my links. I could see that he was wearing my watch and chain. He was actually holding my watch in his hand when he addressed me. As I, I only have half a minute to spare, but 
I wanted to speak to you about the Mary Brooker. I saw her portrait in your room, you remember? She's what is called a criminal lunatic, and she's escaped from Broadmoor. Let me see. I think it was a week today, and, and just about this time. No, no, no. Now it's now quarter to nine. It was just after nine. Hmm. He slipped my watch into his waistcoat pocket. She's still at large, you know. They're on the lookout for her all over England, but she's still at large. They say she's a lunatic. There are lunatics at Broadmoor, but she's not one. She's no more lunatic than you or I, hmm? He touched me lightly on the chest, such as my extreme disgust at being brought into physical contact with him, that even before the slight pressure of his fingers on my, my legs gave way under me, and I sank back into my chair. You're not asleep. No, I said. I am not asleep. Even in my stupefied condition, I was conscious of a desire to leap up and take this man by the throat. Nothing of this however, was portrayed upon my face, or at any rate, he showed no sign of being struck by it. She's a misunderstood genius, that's what Mary Brooker is. She has her tastes, and people do not understand them. She likes to kill. To kill! One of these days she means to kill herself, but in the meantime she takes pleasure in killing others, you see. Hmm? Seating himself on the corner of the table at my side, allowing one foot to rest upon the ground, he swung the other in the air. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's a bit of an actress, too. She wanted to go upon the stage, but they said that she was mad. They were jealous, that's what it was. She's the finest actress in the world. Her acting would deceive the devil himself. They, they allowed that even up Broadmoor, but she only uses her powers for acting to gratify her taste for killing. It was only the other day she bought this knife, hmm? He took, apparently out of the bosom of his vest, a long, glittering, cruel-looking knife. It's quite sharp. Here, feel the point and the edge. He held it out towards me. I did not attempt to touch it. It is probable that I should not have succeeded even if I had attempted. You won't? Oh, perhaps you're right. It's not much fun killing people with a knife. A knife's all very well for cutting them up afterwards. <laughs> but she likes to do the actual killing with her own hands and nails. I wouldn't be surprised if one of these days she were to kill you, perhaps tonight. It's a long time since she killed anyone, and she is hungry. Sorry, I can't stay. But this day, um, week, she escaped from Broadmoor as the clock had finished striking nine, and it only wants ten minutes, you see. He looked at my watch, even holding it out for me to see. Mm -hmm. Good night. With a careless nod, he moved across the room, holding the glittering knife in his hand. When he reached the bedroom door, he turned and smiled. Raising the knife, he waved it towards me in the air, and then he disappeared into the inner room. I was again alone, possibly for a minute or more. But this time it seemed to me that my solitude continued only for a few fleeting seconds. Perhaps the time went faster because I felt, or thought I felt, that the pressure on my brain was giving way. That I only had to make an effort of sufficient force to be myself again and free. And the power of making such an effort was temporarily absent, but something within me seemed to tell me that at any moment of my return. The bedroom door, that door which even as I look back, seems to have been really and truly a door in some unpleasant dream reopened. Mrs. Janes came in. With her rapid stride, she swept across the room. She had something in her right hand which she threw upon the table. Well, she cried, what do you think of the secret of the mask? Hmm? The secret of the mask. Now, although my limbs were powerless throughout it all, I retained to a certain extent the control of my own voice. See here, it is such a little thing, isn't it? She picked up the two objects which she had thrown upon the table. One of them was the preparation of some sort of skin which she had shown to me before. These are the masks. You would not think that they were perfect representations of the human face, a masterpiece of creative art, and yet they are. All the world would be deceived by them as you have been. This is an old woman's face. This is the face of a young man. As she held them up, I could see 
though still a little dimly, that the objects which she dangled before my eyes were, as she said, veritable masks. So perfect are they. They might have been skin from the fronts of living creatures. Hmm? They are such little things, and yet I have made them with what toil. They have been the work of years, these two, and just one other. You see, nothing satisfied me but perfection. I have made hundreds to make these two. People could not make out what I was doing. They thought I was making toys. I told them that I was. They smiled at me. They thought that it was a new phase of madness. <laughs> if that be so, then in madness there is nothing more cool, enduring, unconquerable resolution than in all your sanity. I meant to conquer, and I did. Failure did not dishearten me. I went straight on. I had a purpose to fulfill. I would have fulfilled it even though I should have had to first die. Well, <laughs> it is fulfilled. Turning, she flung the mask into the fire. They were immediately in flames. She pointed at them as they burned. The labor of years was soon consumed. But I should not have triumphed had I not been endowed with genius, the genius of the actor's art. I told myself that I would play certain parts parts which would fit the masks, and that I would be the parts I played. <laughs> not only across the footlights, not only with a certain amount of space between my audience and me, not only for the passing hour, but if I chose for ever and for I. <laughs> uh, so all through the years I rehearsed these parts when I was not engaged upon the mask. That, they thought, was madness in another phase. One of the parts. She came closer to me. Her voice became shriller. One of the parts was that of an old woman. Have you seen her? She's in the fire. She jerked her thumb in the direction of the fireplace. I guess her part is played. She had to see that the tea was drunk. Hmm? Another of the parts was that of a young gentleman. Think of my playing the man. Absurd. There is that about a woman which is not to be disguised. She always reveals her sex when she puts on men's clothes. You noticed it, did you not, when, before dinner, he came to you? When you saw him in the corridor this morning, when yesterday he spent an hour with you in the train? I know you noticed because of these. She drew out of her pocket a handful of things. There were my links, my studs, my watch and chain, and other properties of mine. Although the influence of the drug which had been administered to me in the tea was passing off, I felt, even as more than ever, I felt as though I were an actor in a dream. The third part which I chose to play was the part of Mrs. Jane's. Clasping her hand behind her back, she posed in front of me in an attitude which was essentially dramatic. Look at me well. Scan all my points. Praise me. You say that I am beautiful. I saw that you admired my hair, which flows loose upon my shoulders. She unloosed the fastings of her hair so that it did flow loose upon her shoulders. The bloom upon my cheeks, the dimple in my chin, my face in its entirety. It is the secret of the mask, my friend. The secret of the mask. You ask me why I have watched and toiled and schemed to make the secret mine. She stretched out her hand with an uncanny gesture. Because I wish to gratify my taste for killing. Yesterday I might have killed you. <laughs> Tonight I will. She did something to her head and dress. There was a rustle of drapery. It was like a conjurer's change. Mrs. Jane's had gone, and instead there stood before me the creature with, as, as I had described it to Davis, with the face of a devil, with the face I had seen in the train. The transformation in its entirety was wonderful. <laughs> Mrs. Jane's was a fine, stately woman with a swelling bust and the prime of life. This was a lanky, scraggy creature. 
the short gray hair, fifty of a day. The change extended even to the voice. Mrs. Jane's had the soft, cultivated accents of a lady. This creature shrieked rather than spoke. I am Mary Brooker. It is a week today since I won freedom. The bloodhounds are everywhere upon my track. They are drawing me here. But they shall not have me until I have first of all had you. She came closer, crouching forward, glaring at me with a maniac's eyes. From her lips there came that hideous cry, half gasped, half yelp, which had haunted me since the day before, when I heard it in the stupor of the train. I scratched you yesterday. I bit you. <laughs> I sucked your blood. Now I will suck it dry, for you are mine. <laughs> She reckoned without her host. I had only sipped the tea. I had not, as I had doubtless been intended to do, emptied the cup. I was again master of myself. I was only awaiting a favorable opportunity to close. I meant to fight for life. She came nearer to me, and nearer, uttering all the time that blood-curdling sound, which was so like the frenzied cry of some maddened animal. When her extended hands were all but touching me, I rose up and took her by the throat. She had evidently supposed that I was still under the influence of the drug, because when I seized her, she gave a shriek of astonished rage. I had taken her unawares. I had her over on her back, but I soon found that I had undertaken more than I could carry through. She had not only the face of a devil, she had the strength of one. She flung me off as easily as though I were a child. In her turn, she had me down upon my back. Her fingers closed about my neck. I could not shake her off. She was strangling me. She would have strangled me. She nearly did, when attracted by the creature's hideous cries, which I heard from without. They forced their way into the room. They found me lying unconscious, and as they thought, dead upon the floor. Indeed, for days I hung between life and death. When life did come back again, Mary Brooker was once more an inmate of Her Majesty's House of Detention. At Broadmoor. You've just heard tonight's story from Storylink Radio's Countdown to Halloween 2022. Remember to come back for our next tale. Many more stories of all genres available to listen to and read along with now on our website at www.storylinkradio.com. Visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Story Link Radio. And visit our podcast for easy mobile listening anywhere, anytime. Just search for Story Link Radio on your favorite podcast provider. Oh, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that alert bell for Story Link Radio.